gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the, the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later the disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and said to them, and stood in their midst, and said to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may, you may have life in His name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. His mercy endures forever, said the psalm for today. His mercy endures forever. In the Old Testament, many times the mercy of God is compiled and woven within the, st the story of the people of God, as it is in the case of Psalm 136. That's something I invite you to reflect upon. Specifically how God weaves His mercy and His love unto us. In telling us, peace be with you. He comes into our midst, into the midst in the lives of the apostles, while the doors were locked. That's very significant. That the mercy and love of God, the peace that Christ brings to us, does not remain away from us, but actually comes and weaves itself into our life. That's what the mercy of God does to us. The mercy of God is, is what makes the church one, is what unites the body of Christ, is what keeps us all together, is not all something that comes from within ourselves, but is the love and mercy of God that comes from out of ourselves. It's not something from within, but it's something from without. Without mercy, the life of the church will be tasteless, pointless, the resurrection will have no meaning for us either. Specifically because the resurrection was given to us as a solution to death. But more importantly, as a sign of reconciliation with God. Remember, death came into the world because we sinned. Death is a consequence of sin. Therefore, when Jesus has resolved the problem of death with his resurrection and wants to give us life and life to the full, 
the fullness of life that Christ brings to us wants to bring also the reconciliation with God. Our brokenness, our relationship that is broken with God has been restored to the mercy of God. The solution to the injustice of, of sin and our condemnation to death, the solution is the resurrection. And in that resurrection, also, we remember that it was the Son who died for us. Jesus was offered for ourselves, for our own sins. He brings justice into the equation of sin. He justifies us. Through His suffering, He justified many. All of us are justified because Jesus gave Himself, He sacrificed on the cross for us. So when He raises from the dead, the resurrection of Jesus comes also with the mercy of God. He comes with the mercy because Jesus, uh, because God offers us the very source of our reconciliation with Him, and that's why death does not hold us any longer. Sin does not hold us any longer. God has the last word, and that's what the, re the resurrection is all about. That's why the message of the resurrection, of the Lord's resurrection, as it is described in the Gospels, is specifically aimed with, with and accompanied with the message of reconciliation. Jesus stands in the midst of the apostles while the doors were locked. Again, he makes himself, or he intrudes, as it were, in the life of the apostles who were locked up in the upper room, one assumes, because they were afraid. Fear kept them from accepting the resurrection. Persecution was part of their life. And the disciples were there for fear. That's what the Gospel says. And Jesus comes in their midst, breaks through that fear, and says, Peace be with you. It is a sign of reconciliation. It is a sign that comes to bring peace into the hearts of the apostles, as it brings peace also into our hearts. When Jesus said this, something significant happened in the Gospel for us. He showed them His hands and His side. The signs of His suffering. He was alive, but the resurrected Lord does not remain like a ghost. The resurrected Lord is, has wounds. The wounds that Jesus bears are part of who He is now, even as He is assuming to heaven. The Lord kept the wounds, did not obliterate them. Kept the wounds as a sign of what He, how much He loves us. So he comes to them and shows them his wounds, his hands and his sides. And at that, the disciples rejoice, says the, says the gospel. I think the disciples rejoice, and we rejoice to know that God offered himself to us. He died for us so that we can be reconciled with him always. The disciples rejoice, and Jesus reiterates his message to them, peace be with you. Like saying, this is the reason for you to be at peace, because I have wounds. These wounds are your wounds. These wounds are yours. Your sins I have with me. I have redeemed you for them, and I have the scars to prove it. And then he breathes on them, the breath of divine mercy. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Significant. I think we all would like to be at that particular moment when we will feel the reception of the Holy Spirit coming to our hearts. Sometimes I think we idealize that moment in a sense that we think exists in the world of sentiments and ideas. It wouldn't be good if we always felt the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Wouldn't that be awesome? Always. Every day. Actually, sometimes we even think of the mercy of God in being the same way. So when we feel the forgiveness of the Lord, we feel a certain a relief that our soul has been relieved. It is experienced by people, for example, after they go to confession. 
after a long time. A great, many graces has our church uh, experienced for the past couple of weeks in the sense that we have seen an increase of people going to confession. There is nothing more rejoicing in the heart of a priest than when people ask for the sacrament of reconciliation. It is the mercy of God that it dispenses in that sacrament, such an important part of our life. See, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, is not something that we just do outwardly just to feel better. Sometimes we think that that's the only reason we go to the sacrament, in order to feel better, to have this moment of receiving the Holy Spirit. It was told to the apostles, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. What a power Jesus gave the apostles, and what power bishops and priests have to this day to forgive sins in the name of the Lord. Something that many question, whether a priest can forgive sins, and whether it is necessary for us to go to a priest for confession. And that is the, the trick question, whether it is necessary. Do I have to go to a priest to confession? I don't know, there is a, there is a certain tone there on the, on the question itself, that one should question the question. What is in my heart that wants to question the ability, even though we can read in the Gospels that Jesus gives the authority to the Apostles, and the Apostles, in the Acts of the Apostles, hand on the authority to the priest. What makes us think that it's impossible for God to, for, to dispense His mercy in such a way? He chose to do it that way. Could He have done it in another way? Yeah, He could have done it in another way. There are thousands of ways we can think of that God could have distributed His mercy. He could have made us eat mangoes or something. <laughs> Or, or, I don't know, do this and you have your sins forgiven. Talk to the cloud and your sins will be forgiven. Hug a tree and your sins will be forgiven. He could have said a lot of things, but he didn't do that. He imposed on the apostles the burden of forgiven sins. And I'm saying impose on them the burden because it is not something exactly very pleasant for the priest to experience. Or even though one is, is in dispensing the sacrament and the joy comes when one absolves people's sins, it is painful sometimes for the priest to hear confessions. But I'll tell you why it's painful for the priest to hear confessions. Not because the priest will be scandalized by your sins, but because the priest himself is confronted with his own weakness as he hears his own conscience being echoed in the heart of the faithful. And to that, I can testify. Uh, my heart breaks when I see your broken heart, because I know my heart is broken too. The burden of forgiving sins is given to the apostles as a sign of peace. The priest receives these as a joke. As a joke, not joke. <laughs> I know someone's going to correct my English. <laughs> joke, is that a word? Joke. <laughs> I didn't have a translator. Well, that is what Jesus puts on his shoulder. You know, take my yoke upon you. You know what he said? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus puts this burden on the priest for to hear confessions. It is not an easy burden to carry. But as also it prompts me to go to confession. The more I hear confessions, the more I want to go to confession. It is a, 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 a brushing of each other's souls so that we can get closer and, and closer to the Lord. But then, if we look at the sacrament of reconciliation, as we tend to see it isolated from the rest of the life of the church, where the mercy of God is dispensed, we need to connect it with the sacrament of the Eucharist. We need to connect it to the sacrament of the Eucharist. Sometimes I wonder, why is it that so many people receive communion and so very little go to confession? It's, a, it is a, it's something to ponder upon. Because they go hand in hand. Not that we have to go to confession every time we receive communion, but it should be part of our life. You know, going to confession is like opening a wound that was healing. Oh, going to confession is like opening a wound that it was healing. Is you know when, when you uh, uh, 
cut yourself, and the blood begins to clog, and everything begins to heal. And then you have to peel it off again. It hurts. When you bring it to confession, the wounds of our sins, when we bring it to confession, they have to be healed. So we peel them off again, and it's not bleeding again. That's why people don't want to go to confession. It's like, I'm, I'm trying to heal this already. I'm trying to heal all this, and now you're asking me to go to the priest and get the wound open again. Well, for the wound to heal, it needs to be reopened and then nurtured with the sacrament of the Eucharist while we are in the state of grace. The communion antiphone for this Sunday says, Bring your hand and feel the place of the nails, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Alleluia. Bring your hand and feel the place of the nails. That is significant because when we come to the Eucharist, we touch the wounds of Jesus. When we receive communion, we're, res we're receiving the resurrected Christ with his wounds. That's when we receive in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So when we receive the Lord, he comes to heal our wounds too. And that's why the wound needs to be opened, my brothers and sisters. That's why we need to go to confession often. Keep opening the wound so that he can keep healing it. Lest the world tries to peel something just on top of it and try to create a crust that we may forget. What the Lord wants is to touch us, specifically to the Eucharist, to heal us, to heal our wounds, so that we come into true reconciliation with him. Again, Jesus tells the apostles, whose sins you have forgiven and forgiven them, and whose sins you retain and retain. The burden for priests to hear confessions. But actually, my brothers and sisters, not only in the sacrament of reconciliation is the mercy of God to be dispersed, also the challenge of the Holy Spirit is directed to us as people, to you, who sins you forgive, who sins you forgive. How hard it is, my brothers and sisters, to forgive those who harm us those who have done wrong to us, those who have perhaps even gossiped, who have said things, who done things against us, when false witness is raised against us, when our souls are wounded because we love others that they do not love us back. We are bruised by the lack of love in life. We are bruised. And we want to look for someone to come and to say, Forgive me. I mean, I, I, I'm, I assure you that all of us have a list of people that we would like to receive forgiveness, for, uh, no, to ask forgiveness, that they ask us to forgive them. I have to rephrase myself. How many people have wronged us? And we look at them in our memory, and it lingers in our hearts, sometimes by days, sometimes for years. Our hearts are wounded by the lack of love that we have perhaps received. How do we forgive them if they do not ask for forgiveness? That's hard for the soul to do. In the world of ideas, we know that God always forgives us. Like he says in the Our Father, forgive, we, t we tell him in the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Becomes a sort of requisite for us to receive mercy, that we also are merciful with those who are around us. Every argument, every fight between people, every uh, lack of love is stopped and distracted by the mercy of God, by mercy. Stops and distracts when we say, please, please, I beg you to forgive me. Now, we can say that, but we can say it with sarcasm. We can approach someone who has wronged us and self-entitled said to them, Oh, sorry, forgive me for not being what you want me to be. Do you see the tone of sarcasm? See, that's pride. Pride kicks inside our souls and wants to tell us often and often that we do not need to forgive, that others do need to be forgiven that we, perhaps, maybe God will forgive them, but somehow that we can hold on to these grudges as long as we have them. 
does not the message of the, of the resurrection of the Lord, but the message is deeper unless we come to the Lord and then tell Him, Lord, give me the strength to forgive. May I be merciful like you are merciful. May I distribute mercy as you distribute mercy. Yesterday, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, inviting us to a year of mercy, a jubilee year of mercy, which will begin December 8th. Uh, why? Why is it so important? Now that the church is suffering martyrdom and persecution, the last thing that one would think, at least the people who uh, think a lot and give offer their opinion on television, will be to distribute mercy. But mercy and forgiveness is a trademark of Christianity. Jesus said, no, it's not an eye for an eye. If someone offends you and slaps you in the face, offer you the other sheep, there is a different kind of uh, uh, teaching the Lord is giving us. So in this time, the church is asked to offer and open the door to, for to forgiveness and mercy. And in the year, he's going to open the door, the Jubilee door at St. Peter's Basilica, as other doors will be opened in the churches. As a symbol, what he says is a call to open the doors of mercy. As a church, we need to open the doors of mercy. As a church, that needs to be at the forefront of our gospel proclamation. Because many people, brothers and sisters, are far from the church because they think that we will not forgive them or that God has no forgiveness for them. Many think that there is no way out. There is no way for them to enter through these doors to be part of the community once again. So what do we have to do as a church? What do we have to do as a church in order to transmit the message that at the center of the gospel is forgiveness for our sins? When we begin to recognize our own weaknesses and flaws, before we dispense forgiveness that we ask to be forgiven. So how do we engage as I said, mercy ends every argument. If we just tell them that the Lord will forgive us, that the Lord forgives us, that even if we have flawed them, or even if they have seen the wrongs that we as a church can do, to forgive, that's at the center of the gospel. If we cannot forgive, uh, we'll never get together. We'll never join hands again, and we're never going to enter into the banquet of the Lord to ask for forgiveness to them. So, how does this look like when we're talking with people who are not active in the church, who are perhaps uh, even against the church? We need to speak the language of forgiveness and mercy. We need to speak that language because it's a language that every human heart is related to. They may not understand how the, the, the doctrine of justification works and all the things that, that we have to offer as a church, but mercy and forgiveness they do understand. So I will say, if someone says, well, why doesn't the church, uh, why does the church do this, or the members of the church are sinners? Well, I don't like to go to church because there are hypocrites over there. Do they say that? You know, I don't go to church because it's filled with hypocrites. Welcome, all of you. <laughs> Someone asked me for Mass. Where is everybody from last week? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure they're in town. <laughs> but that's the crowd I'm looking for. But then I'm here. I'm preaching to the hypocrites. <laughs> it's a joke, okay? <laughs> but they say the church is full of hypocrites, so what do we do? I will say, yeah. If somebody tells me, Father, the pool is full of hypocrites, I will say, yeah, I'm the first one. I'm a hypocrite. I am. I'm a sinner. I'm trying not to be. I go to confession. I try to live the same life I'm asking you to live. So forgive me. I'm trying. As a church, I'm trying. I go to church because I am a sinner. 
I gave my life to the church because my many sins are many. I have to do penance for the rest of my life. That's my joke. <laughs> and you are my penance. <laughs> so when people say that, talk to them like that. Tell them, yeah, forgive me. Well, the Pope is a hypocrite. Yeah, forgive him too. Pray for him. Do not go the other road and try to deny sin and weakness because that's true. It is true. The church is full of sinners. May it be full of more sinners. May we break the walls here. Because they can say, those people at San Martin, they're such sinners, they have to build a larger church. <laughs> May sinners come. We want to fill this space with sinners. Because that's what Jesus came for. He came to save sinners. We ask the Blood Virgin Mary, who as we say in the South of Regina, we said to her, look on us with those eyes of mercy. May we have eyes of mercy towards each other. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.